Thank you. Um, you feel rather inadequate, you know, when you see these names on the wall. I used to tell my students that compared to these people, we're worms. Um, they, are, they are really incredibly uh, gifted and talented. We can't. Uh, but I'll tell you a story about Edward Teller. Uh, when, um, I can't remember what year it was, but uh, some Republican was running for president. And Teller was here in Cleveland to uh, campaign for him. And he went to all the ethnic... Uh, organizations to try and, and garner support, probably for old man Bush, I think. Oh, and Reagan. Oh, maybe, maybe Reagan, yeah. Anyhow, I, I was always his, I always introduced him at these places, and I'd always tell a story that uh, there was a luncheon meeting, and uh, <clears throat> there were about 10 uh, Nobel Prize winners sitting there, and uh, Edward Teller was also there. And uh, <clears throat> suddenly, uh, somebody brought in a letter and it was addressed to the greatest physicist in the world. So all of these physicists really got anxious and they grabbed for the letter and they said, boy, I won my Nobel Prize last year. I'm, this is me. I won my Nobel Prize two years ago. And they almost tore it apart trying to give, grab a hold of it. And at the end, uh, somebody said, well, you know, let's, we can't decide. Let's just open it up and see what it said. And the greeting was, dear Dr. Teller. <laughs> so that's, uh, that, he always liked that story, but he thought maybe <laughs> it was a little bit too. Uh, I also want to tell you that uh, on the, uh, forgot to tell you that I have a Nobel <laughs> Prize. <laughs> I gave a math talk at a large assemblage, and uh, their usual custom at the end was to uh, reward the speaker on, on the basis of how many bells were rung in terms of the quality of the, of the lecture. And uh, <clears throat> five bells was outstanding, four bells was good, two bells was poor, one bell was terrible. I win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you don't expect very much. Uh, but I want to congratulate Bonnie. This is a wonderful exhibit. I, uh, I, I, I think we, we, under, well, how I, we underappreciate all the effort that uh, some people have put in through the years to make our lives more interesting and comfortable and uh, provide us with uh, information and, and uh, enjoyment. Uh, so, but it is, uh, it is a pleasure to be here. I'm glad you're all here. It's uh, uh, kind of funny to see so many people wanting to hear about math. You know, um, I... <laughs> I had stories about some of my relatives and friends actually visiting uh, isolation wards and trying to get a rare disease so they'd have a good excuse not to show up. <laughs> but uh, I'll try and make it interesting. One of the things about this, uh, <clears throat> some people complain that it's in English. But anybody who was born here, as you see, I'm speaking extemporaneously. It's much easier for me to do so in English than it is in Hungarian, <coughs> especially when you talk about uh, well, maybe common things that we all share that we know about. Uh, so, uh, but I will refer to my notes occasionally because I, I, uh, this is not one of those kinds of lectures that you, that you deliver regularly. And I've been away from math for quite a while. So uh, <clears throat> I'm not, and plus especially the details of, some, of lives. But uh, and the other thing is that you never know what kind of audience you get. I see here a lot of people who may know more than I do about math, but uh, <clears throat> Math is a rather not well understood subject. So let me ask you a quiz to start off. Can you name me four famous 20th century mathematicians? If you're a math major, of course, this is not for you. It's for people who aren't math majors or who don't have an extensive uh, experience or, or with math. How about giving me four? I, I'm using four because if you came in early, you saw two of the names were up there, uh, Neumann and uh, the gentleman that I'm going to talk about, Erdős. Uh, give me two more. Famous 20th century mathematicians. Hungarian? Pardon me? No, no, no. Math anybody, anywhere. Yeah, from, from the cosmos. From the cosmos. You see? Okay. Pardon me? Who? Turing. 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 Turing.
Oh, touring. Okay, touring. That was the one. Yeah, that was. And uh, give me another one. So you see, it's it's fairly rare. What? Bernoulli, 20th century. Uh, all right. Anyhow, uh, name me four famous. Uh, Olympic curlers from the 20th century. <laughs> you see, math is equivalent to curling. Uh, now, here's a math joke. Uh, so there's some similarity, I guess, between math and curling. Uh, what do uh, Winnie the Pooh and Alexander the Great have in common? This is a math joke. Their middle name. <laughs> All right, let's get down to business here. All right. So there are a lot of misconceptions about math also. And uh, I'm going to try and give you a little flavor of what mathematics is like. The reason you don't know mathematicians is because the subject now is so abstract that uh, I have a rather unflattering description of why it can't be described people later on from a mathematician. I, I don't want to say the same thing. I'll just blame it on him, you know. But uh, so it's, it's so abstract that it can't be explained. What do mathematicians do? As a matter of fact, what is the definition of mathematics? The only definition that I know that is accurate is circular, and mathematics is what mathematicians do. It's impossible to define what mathematics is anymore. It's simply impossible. Uh, the only, it, you know, and some people say you manipulate symbols and all that kind of stuff, but it, um, I mean, as a mathematician, not as an applied person, but as a mathematician, uh, you, it's impossible to, and, and uh, you'll find out when I, when I list you uh, the uh, fields in which uh, von Neumann worked, uh, you will see that I think you won't have any idea what they are. Uh, the, there's just simply no way to describe it. So there's, uh, there are a lot of misconceptions. One is that we deal with numbers. We don't. We might deal with the properties of numbers, um, which is what uh, Erdős did. And I'll show you some examples of, uh, perhaps of an example of what, the, what we mean by properties. But one of them is a prime number. What is a prime number? It's a number divis not divisible. Oh, you know. Tell me. All right. Well, we're going to have part audience participation. A number uh, only divi divisible by one and itself. Correct. Very good. A number only divisible by one and itself. Two. And the, what's the smallest prime number? Two. Two. Very good. Not one, but two. For reasons that make sense for a formula. That's the only reason. <laughs> uh, which is the same way that y is... Uh, <coughs> I forgot what I was going to say. Anyhow, it, 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 some things just, oh, well, why, why, why is zero factorial one, you know? A factorial symbol is you multiply every number between that number and one by itself. Well, there ain't no number between zero and one, so why zero factorial one? Just because formulas come out nicely when you do that. Uh, so there are all kinds of reasons for things. Why is anything to the zero power equal to one? Just because life is easier that way. Uh, there's no reason that it has to be that way. Uh, but so there are misconceptions. Uh, prime numbers. Uh, the Greeks proved that uh, there is an infinitude of prime numbers. So mathematics always requires proof. And the uh, second thing about mathematics is that it deals in, in huge generalities. How can you prove that there's an infinitely many of something? You know? So by the, by, by the fourth century BC, we were on that track. The Greeks, uh, Greek mathematics is unbelievable. Uh, there are certain treatises in Greek mathematics that a very advanced student in, in undergraduate mathematics will have a great deal of trouble deciphering. Very difficult. From primarily Apollonius's lecture on conic sections. Tremendously difficult, fantastic work. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a lot of but, but uh, uh, Erdős got his PhD when he was 21. I'm going to jump back and forth. So uh, Erdős got his PhD at 21. And uh, the 
Uh, in Hungary, it was you didn't have to have a degree. You got a PhD if you produced something that was really worthwhile. And this thesis was so worthwhile that um, I forget the name of the German mathematician who said that uh, uh, Erdős was uh, der Zauberer von Ungarn, the magician from uh, Hungary. Uh, what he proved was that between any number and, and its double, there's always a prime number. Uh, very difficult proof. If it's, it's available on the internet if any of you want to spend the next two years trying to decipher it. Uh, so, uh, but you know, once again, you see, any number, it could be as big as, what? Am I, am I crowding you? No, no, no. Uh, am, I, am I doing what Trump did to Hillary? <laughs> uh, uh, what? Anyhow, that's, uh, <clears throat> so that, you know, remarkable. No matter how big this number is, there's a prime between n and 2n. His most famous proof for which he's probably going to be remembered forever is that there's been a long attempt to find out how many primes there are. That's called the prime number theorem. And uh, he, we don't know how many <laughs> there are. We just know that they're, they reach a certain limit, a certain number if you go farther and farther and farther and farther. And he, and I think in 1948, uh, gave a, very e um, a fairly elementary proof of, of a formula that was known before. The formula is rather complicated. I won't bother quoting it for you. It's got stuff like natural logarithms in it. And, uh, so, <clears throat> there is a, so that was his major. That's probably the theorem for which he will always be remembered. Now, you know, I, I gave the lecture. I'll put it back up when I need the slides. I gave the lecture the title, uh, Mathematic, Magyarország, uh, Mathematics Superpower. And there are three names there, uh, Bojai, Erdős, and von Neumann, or Neumann. Now he's von Neumann because his father got nobility, so he's Margitai yeah. Neumann Janos. Um, so that's, uh, but those three are, are the immortals, and the reason, they, they'll always be remembered. And I'll quote you some reasons why, why they will be, and not my opinion, but the opinion of far more um, uh, <clears throat> uh, celebrated mathematicians who, whose, whose opinion is uh, worth more than mine. But nonetheless, they'll, they, all of their names will, will, ne will never disappear. And, and, and not only that, but their contributions were seminal. They made contributions that, that made progress in mathematics possible or spread uh, mathematics uh, in, in, in a different direction. Uh, the, other, uh, the other misconception is that mathematics isn't useful. You know? And uh, that, of course, is far from the truth. Uh, I don't think there's anything today that's quantitative that, that you, that's around you that is not based on mathematics. Um, uh, you, you go to computers, you go to medicine, you go to anything. It's, it's all math. Um, and a lot of discoveries are made because of math. Um, there, I, I remember when I, I was a physics major actually, but I switched to math and I'll tell you why later. Uh, it's not because I flunked. Uh, but uh, uh, the, um, uh, there, was, there, was a, there was a problem there where you had to do rotational motion under a central force. And uh, you do all the vector analysis on that stuff. And all of a sudden, there's a little piece there uh, that describes the motion of the particle, which you've never seen before. What is it? Well, it turns out to be the Coriolis force. Uh, it's the force that, if, if you have a body that's hanging freely, you, have you gone to these European cathedrals? where you've seen these long um, uh, uh, hanging wire, wires and then the hanging on the bottom and this thing is going around in circles. Well, the Coriolis force was first noticed because, well, it was noticed because things moved in circles. But, but it comes out from this particular equation, which had nothing to do. You never know ahead of time what you're going to get. Uh, Paul Dirac did some equations in physics, and all of a sudden he discovered antimatter. It was there. It showed up in the math. So it, does it exist? 
and then he did the experiment, and now we have antimatter has been verified. Lots of stuff gets, uh, comes out from the math nowadays, and then all of a sudden it's verified. Uh, <clears throat> so it's not useless. One of the horrible things about uh, the misconceptions about math, another one of my math jokes, uh, what's the difference between a PhD in math and a 20-inch pizza? 20 inch, 20, inches. 20 inch pizza? 20 inches. No, 20 inch pizza feeds a family of four. <laughs> bad, 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 really bad joke. What's that? 20 inch pizza feeds a family of four. Bad jokes are terrible. Bad, very bad. My children used to cringe. All right, should I go on? All right, anyhow. <laughs> What's that? That one's a Nobel Prize. That, was that the Nobel Prize? All right, okay, all right, all right, all right. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, math is always also very dangerous. Did you know that? Uh, did you know what happened to King David? Nobody? Nobody leaves the Bible here. Huh? Uh, King David was told not to count the Jews. And he did it. And as a result, there were 70,000 deaths and plagues and everything going on. And there was the angel of the Lord was above Jerusalem with a sword. So math is very dangerous. You have to be very careful with it. Um, <clears throat> to this day, Jews do not count themselves. If, you go, if the Jews in an Orthodox Jewish ceremony, uh, if they want to know whether they can hold the ceremony, I think they need eight people. Uh, they will not count one, two, three, four, five, six... They will, they will go under, they'll say a, a rhyme or a rhythm, and if they can get through the rhythm, then they know they have eight people. So they will, it's still, Orthodox still won't count. Um, well, anyhow, let's, let's go to the middle of, to the, ah, let me just start here. Uh, all of these guys have something in common. Uh, that's why I picked Erdős, um, von Neumann, and Boyai. They were all very precocious as young people. You can't call them geniuses because you're only a genius if you produce something worthwhile, but they were extremely precocious. Erdős, when he was four, allegedly, could, you came into his house and he would ask you, when were you born? And he would figure out you were 27 years old or 30 years old, and he would tell you how many seconds you've been alive. Right. That's four. At the age of three, he discovered negative numbers. Uh, which took mankind, what, 20,000 years? I don't know how long it took, but at the age of four. Now, I have co I've computed it. Uh, in one year, there are roughly 31,557,600 seconds. So I challenge any one of you to multiply that by 27 and tell me how many seconds you've lived uh, in your head. Uh, his, his parents, of course, were math teachers, which I don't know that that proves that that makes you smart, but they did teach him math eventually, and I think Erdős mastered calculus, I think, by the age of 12. Uh, so he was very good at calculus by 12. Uh, most of these guys did. Uh, John von Neumann mastered calculus at the age of 8. Uh, I mastered calculus when I was 50. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that, that's, that's remarkable. Uh, um, Boyai mastered calculus, I think, by the age of 13, plus uh, everything that was known about physics at the time. Uh, so uh, he was also... Uh, the other reason that I picked these three people... Well, we're not going to get very far, are we? Uh, we're going to... I'll go to my text pretty soon. The other reason I, that I picked these people is because they all, they all share another characteristic, which is the fact that they grew up under very adverse circumstances, except for von Neumann. He, he really had a very nice, easy life. But uh, uh, can you imagine Boya? Uh, he was born, I think, in 1802. Uh, you know, it's only 100 years after the Turks devastated uh, Magyarország. Uh, I don't know uh, if any of you, I don't think any of you, are, maybe some of you did. I don't know if you ever saw personally what happened in Germany after the Second World War. You know, I did. I saw Nuremberg, and all you saw were three spires standing up. 
and I saw München, and nothing was there. Well, Hungary must have been like that in, seven, in 1800. It was only 100 years after they kicked the Turks out. Uh, so there were no universities, no nothing. How are you gonna, how are you gonna uh, nurture your mathematical talent? Because he had talent, no question about it. Uh, so there's the adverse circumstance. Uh, uh, his father was a good friend of Gauss. And uh, he asked Gauss if he could send his son to him to have him uh, live with Gauss so that he would have first-rate instruction at the University of Göttingen. And Gauss refused even though they were very best friends. So Boyer had to go to a military academy. He became a military engineer. Um, and yet he still, in his free time, did something remarkable. And I'll read the remarkable in a minute. Um, Erdős was the same way. You know? uh, his, his mother, I, I don't want to get into politics, but his mother had a difficult time making a living because they were Jewish. And uh, his father was in a prisoner of war camp for six years between 1915 and 1921. Um, and uh, uh, so he really never, uh, plus he, you know, he's a weirdo, basically. Uh, a very nice weirdo, but a weirdo. Uh, <coughs> and uh, eccentric, let's put it that way. Let's, let's, let's be nice, let's be nice. He was eccentric. Uh, he, had a he had more difficulty making a living than other people did. But he certainly had a, a, a very difficult life because of the fact that he, there was really, and even in Hungary, even if he would have been allowed to stay, the university professorships did not pay that well. So, but he, maybe he would have had a fairly good life, but being Jewish, he felt that he wanted to get away from it. And, uh, and, but, but like I said, his eccentricities made it much more difficult for him. Von Neumann had it easy. He was, a, he was an incredible genius. At the age of 15, his father hired him a, the most famous mathematician in the country, uh, Segu Gabor. I always say things in Hungarian, or the word order. Segu Gabor, who is a f world famous mathematician. And at the age of 15, uh, Segu burst into tears when he, f when he first uh, heard, uh, saw how, what a talent he had at his, at, at available to him there to teach him advanced calculus. Uh, uh, he just intuited it. And that's the thing, you intuit it. These people don't need to be taught. You're a genius. That's one of the signs of genius. You don't need to be taught. Uh, you, you, you intuit it. You know it. You know it. Uh, and that happens in a lot of, lot of fields, but only the ones that don't require uh, personal uh, in, you know, knowledge about society. And we have a lot of prodigies in music. We have a lot of prodigies in chess. And we have a lot of prodigies in math. Um, I don't know if we have a lot of projects in physics, maybe somebody can tell me that. Uh, but, uh, but we probably do, but that's all, all in the brain. Uh, you don't need to be very socially conscious to know what's going on there. But all right, let me, uh, let me, uh, I can't read if I don't have glasses, you see. Uh, I know where they are. Oh, they're there. Okay, so I didn't know where they are. <laughs> yeah, pardon me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. I'm, my mind is very absent. <laughs> now, I think um, I've talked long enough, haven't I? We're we're getting to the end here. Uh, let me let me talk about. Uh, say a few words about Erdős. Uh, he was a very eccentric, but he was very kind. And what, he, what, what, was, what di distinguished him uh, very much is the fact that um, he wanted to nurture young talent. And every mathematician who refers to him, and every American mathematician calls him Uncle Paul. And the reason is that he nurtured young mathematicians, and most of them were Hungarian. And what did they call him? They called him Polybachi. So that stuck. That's the only way to translate Polybachi. There are a lot of stories about him. The, one of the interesting ones is that uh, he was in, uh, in Calcutta, India. He was known to be that, and he called young mathematicians epsilons. Uh, if you have calculus, you know what that means. If you haven't, then I won't bother telling you. But it just means something small. <laughs> And uh, uh, so he called them epsilons. And he was in Calcutta. 
and, uh, and then Epsilon sent his father over because he had discovered something new, and he knew that Erdős would be interested. And, they, and he said, no, I don't want to talk to your father. I want to talk to you. So he, made, he actually interrupted his trip, and he went from Calcutta to Madras uh, to talk to this young man and see whether he, he had enough talent for him to worry about. Erdős, of course, was very picky. He would not talk to you. I met I, saw, I walked by him in the halls a couple of times at math conventions, and uh, he, wa he would not talk to anyone. You had to be very, very smart to have Erdős's attention. Um, and he would, but he did try to nurture young talent. Uh, and he wrote a little uh, poem about that. He, when he went to Madras, he said, this, this, to, th this is the city of Madras, home of the curry and the dal, where the Iyer speak only to the Iyergers, and the Iyergers speak only to God. That's a takeoff. You know that one, of the, uh, the American version of that? Uh, Boston, the home of the beef and the cod, where the Lowell's only talk, the Cabots only talk to the Lowell's, and the Lowell's only talk to God. This is uh, social snobbery, of course. Uh, but, you know, he knew something about India, where he knew that the, the Iyers were a high caste Brahmin uh, group, and the Iyergars were even higher caste Brahmin group. Um, then other stories, he, he gave $1,000 to somebody who thought was so talented that he could go to Harvard. He, get, he just gave him $1,000. And um, <clears throat> uh, 10 years later, the guy wanted to pay him back, and he asked uh, what, what she should, you know, how much interest he should pay, and he said, no. He said, do the same thing to somebody else. Uh, so he was a very generous man, uh, very, very kind. People, he, he, was, he was probably a very bad house guy. He would bang the pots at 4.30 in the morning to get you to do math. He did math 19 to 20 hours a day, uh, and uh, he, he, to the end of his life. At the, he died at the age of 84, I think, or something like that. Uh, to the end of the day, he would wake you up, and, and, the, and, he, and he would want you to take care of him. Uh, there's a famous story where he, he visited a man by the name of Graham. Graham was his uh, surrogate mother. He needed everything done for him. And uh, he would look in the refrigerator, and Graham always stocked the refrigerator with grapefruit because Erdős loved grapefruit. And uh, Erdős would look in the refrigerator, close the door, and he'd ask Graham, where's the grapefruit? And, the, and Graham said, go look for it. And he said, where? In the refrigerator. Where in the refrigerator? So he'd get the, and then he would take the blunt end of a, of a, of a uh, butter knife and try to cut the, uh, the uh, grapefruit with that, and then of course everything would splatter, and so Graham gave up and he gave him breakfast every morning. Uh, one other ma mathematician found a trail of red blood going from the kitchen all over the house, and what, had, what he had done is he didn't know how to open a tomato can, so he punched a hole in the side <laughs> and, and carried it everywhere. So he's not, I don't think he was a very pleasant guest. But anyhow, uh, let's talk about his achievements. Which, and then we'll talk about the other achievements. He did win the Wolf Prize, which is $100,000. He gave it all away. Uh, he set up a scholarship in uh, Israel. Uh, he had originally, earlier, set up a scholarship in Hungary, four years earlier. So he did not, uh, a lot of these guys never had much connection with Hungary, even though they were Hungarian origin, but Erdős did. He, he came back, and like I said, most of his protégés were Hungarian. So he kept his ties with Hungary and he set up. There's another very nice story that uh, uh, I found out inadvertently because Orban, Orban Viktor, went to a gymnasium in, what's it? Székesfehérvár. And, and uh, the uh, there's a club, there's a math club there which was founded by some math teacher probably in the early 70s. And... He wrote Erdős to see if this was really a worthwhile project. And Erdős said yes, and as a matter of fact, he gave him money to endow uh, a prize for the best student at this club. So he, he really did try to help as much. He was a, he was a very gentle, very kind man, uh, but, but extremely eccentric and very demanding. He would want you to, he would, if he lived, he, he went, visited a mathematician somewhere and he had to go to San Francisco. He wanted him to drive him two hours to the airport because he couldn't go there any other way. He, you know, he, had no, he, said, he, he said, I think I can make cold cereal. 
Uh, I, he said, I think I could boil an egg, but I've never tried. So that, that was the extent of his, uh, he, he, he wanted this host to do his laundry, to do everything, and to get him to the next, uh, next destination. He traveled everywhere. Uh, he never stayed in the same place more than a month. Uh, there were a couple of places where he did stay for a month. Uh, but he did have 1,500, roughly 1,500 published papers. Now, if you think about it, uh, are you keeping track of my time? Or? No. no. Can I talk till yeah. 5 o'clock this afternoon? Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> oh, there, you know, it's an inexhaustible subject. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah, 1,500 pages, 1,500 papers. Uh, some of, uh, many, all of them are good. Some of them are very good, and some of them are really outstanding. But uh, the average mathematician only publishes about three or four, 1,500 versus three or four. And that average, of course, is the median. Here's a math lesson. Uh, if I, if I run a shop and I pay myself a million dollars and uh, these six employees, 10,000 each, what's the average salary in my shop? Around $200,000, right? Or $160,000, roughly, right? So I report that to the government and they say, wow, what a generous soul. All right, now, was that a lie? The, the fact that, uh, that I have an average salary of $160,000, was that a lie? What's the other one? Uh, a big lie or statistics? <laughs> well, okay, it's statistics, but it's the misuse of statistics, and that's where always, see, there is no such thing as lies, big lies, and statistics. It's always the misuse of statistics. Because the thing you should say at that point is that the, the, the correct statistics you use is the median, which is the halfway point. So it ha in the middle is $10,000, and that's much more indicative of what's going on there. Uh, misuse of statistics has caused huge problems. Uh, the Ch shuttle Challenger crashed because of misuse of statistics. Uh, the uh, draft lottery, anybody re remember the draft lottery? Uh, the draft lottery was a misuse of statistics and caused all kinds of problems. So there's a lot of places where statistics is misused, but, and of course statistics has its inherent problems. It, it can't predict things perfectly, but it's, if you do it properly, it's a pretty good tool. Um, but 1,600 papers. Uh, he had, I think, 400, 250 con uh, co-authors, and I don't know how many, but there are 250,000 mathematicians who have an Erdős number, which is your connection to Erdős. If you wrote a paper with him, you're a one. If, you're a, if you wrote a paper with somebody who wrote a paper, you're a two, and so on down the line. Um, anybody know Frank Ryan? Anybody remember? Yeah, he was the quarterback for the Cleveland Browns. Yeah. He has an Erdős number of four. He's a PhD in math. He taught at Rice. Um, uh, anybody remember Theodore Kaczynski? The Unabomber. The Unabomber. Yeah. He ha doesn't have an Erdős number because he never had a co-author. He has four math papers, um, but he doesn't have a co-author. So he's got a, he's got. A, but you know, but I'm just like, I'm 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 also like uh, President Trump. I have something extremely big, and it's not my hands. It's my Erdős number. It's infinity. <laughs> <laughs> Your address number is infinity if you don't have any published papers jointly. So anyhow, I got a Nobel Prize and I have an infinite address number. So that, <laughs> there it is. Uh, let me tell you something about Boyoy. Uh, I'll, I'll wrap it up and then we'll talk about uh, um, uh, By the way, Adler died in 19, uh, 1996 in Warsaw attending a math conference. But, and he's buried in Magyarország in, uh, in a Jewish cemetery in Budapest. He, he joined his mother and father there. Uh, his mother had a horrible tragedy. Uh, she brought the newborn son home, and the two older sisters died that very same day from septic scarlet fever. So uh, she became very attached to him. That's why he was the basket case that he was. Uh, he told the story that when he when he, he got his Ph.D. when he was 21, and then he went to Manchester to go on a Rockefeller Fellowship or something like that. And he said he went to a common uh, eating area, 
And uh, he said he saw people buttering their bread. He said he had never done it before. So he looked what they did. He'd take a knife and, you, and he said it was fairly easy. He said, I, I guess I could do it. But he never buttered his bread before. Uh, <laughs> his mother doted on him. They say they slept in the same bed, I'm not sure, until he went to college. Um, now some things might be spurious, you never know. Uh, but anyhow, Boyai, why is Boyai famous for? Uh, he discovered, uh, he didn't discover, uh, well, he discovered a new type of geometry where parallel lines uh, never meet. I mean, they, what am I talking about? <laughs> Hyperbolic, hyperbol where there are no parallel lines. Uh, so uh, until what, for 2,000 years? The best-selling book by the world, in the world, by the way, it, maybe it's the Bible, but the second best-selling book is Euclid's Elements of Geometry. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> everybody knows. Everybody studies Euclid's Elements of Geometry. And there, what? Parallel lines never meet, right? Yeah. In, uh, in uh, Boyoy's Geometry, there, and there's only one parallel line. In Boyoy's Geometry, there are infinitely many parallel lines. Now, uh, that is maybe contradictory, but I can show you why that's certainly true. And uh, the, the geometry that you describe, there we go back to math. The geometry that you describe depends on the axioms that you set up. There are five axioms, and from those five axioms, you, divide, you derive everything else. And if you, your fifth axiom is the parallel axiom. And that, of course, means that triangles add up to 180 degrees. That's necessarily then true. Uh, but if you'd have a different axiom that there are infinitely many, pa many parallel lines, you get a different geometry. And uh, uh, it's a remarkable, it, uh, remarkable, but, uh, and it, it, it set the, it, it really will forever be remembered. And here's what a mathematician said about that particular accomplishment, and that's why Bolio, you will be immortal. The treatise itself, therefore, by the way, it appeared in 1826, I think, or 27. The treatise it itself, therefore, contains only 24 pages, by the way, written in Latin. The most extraordinary two dozen pages in the whole history of thought. How different with Boya Janos, who claimed at once, unflinchingly, that their discovery marked an epoch in human thought so momentous as to be unsurpassed by anything recorded in the history of philosophy or of science, demonstrating as had never been proved before the supremacy of pure reason at the very moment of overthrowing what had forever seemed its surest possession, the axioms of geometry. So it set math on a completely new course. It didn't have to be fun, uh, based on what observed things. You could start doing what I told you. Sometimes the definition of math is what? It's manipulation of symbols, right? So you didn't have to have this physical thing underlying whatever it was you're doing. You're doing something new with just with your mind and with some symbols. Now let me tell, talk a little bit about Neumann. Uh, and here's, here's what I mentioned to you uh, before. Uh, here's, what, here's what Neumann worked in. He made major contra By the way, Neumann has, I think, something like 200 published papers of, of far more Difficulty, say, than Adduch, or, or let's say a little more variety. But here's what he worked in. Foundations of mathematics, uh, which is set theory, basically, and logic. Functional analysis. Now, who knows what functional analysis is? Ergodic theory. Representation theory. Operator algebras. Topology, numerical analysis, you add. if you're an engineer, you know what that is. Physics, he worked in quantum mechanics, hydrodynamics, and quantum statistical mechanics. He worked in economics and game theory. He worked in computing, and he worked in statistics. But, uh, but even there, what, you know, what the, 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 the subject or the, the results themselves cannot be, cannot be Proven. Let me uh, go here and I'll show you a couple of pictures and then I'll, I'll wind up. By the way, von Neumann was instrumental in, uh, von Neumann was, a, this is really, I mean, this is genius. Uh, von Neumann was, I, he, his father wanted him to become a chemical engineer because 
He didn't think you could make enough money at math. You see that pizza, the 20-inch pizza? It's not so far. And uh, so he didn't think you could, you could make uh, money at math. So he wanted him to become a chemical engineer. So von Neumann uh, matriculated at the same time in Berlin in uh, chemical engineering, in Budapest in mathematics. He then switched his field from, uh, switched his study from Berlin to Switzerland, where he finished the, uh, the uh, chemical engineering course. And at the same time that he got his bachelor's in chemical engineering, he got his PhD in mathematics in Budapest. He never went to a math class. And uh, I think it was Wigner, I'm not sure whether it was Wigner or Szilard, who said that it was so easy for him that he, even his PhD, the defense of his PhD thesis was so easy for him that it, it required no effort. He could just do it. He'd just knock it off. And he wrote a seminal paper, an extremely important paper, on, in, uh, in set theory, which again I can't explain to you, but it, it set mathematics on an, an entirely different new course. It, uh, it uh, solved certain problems, certain dilemmas that had occurred in, in mathematics because of uh, Russell's paradoxes and things of that sort, but where set theory uh, became rather, um, how should I say, um, controversial. Uh, but let me, uh, let me see if I can show you some pictures and then I'll, I shall. Uh, th this subject, I, I, did, I thought I'd have a 20 minute lecture, you know, and I haven't even started. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them while I monkey around with this machine. Uh, is that thing on? Or did it turn off because it had no signal? There we go. There we go. So there was the title of my talk. Um, now, uh, I, I'll skip this stuff. I was going to show you the beauty of math. Um, why, why, did, why did I switch from physics to math? Because I thought, well, I didn't, I didn't like anything practical. So that, that kept me out of it. I didn't want to be in a lab. Uh, I've done enough of that when I was an undergraduate. I worked in a lab at Chemat Corporation. Uh, so I wanted, but I thought math was beautiful. And I was going to show you some of the be beauties of math, but that ain't me. Uh, maybe, maybe we have to go to, uh, no, no, we have to go to HDMI 1. No, it's there. Oh, you put it in? That's going to be there. Uh, let's see if we go to HDMI 1. Where's that uh, input? There we go. There we go. All right. Um, but uh, uh, very quickly, uh, where's the slideshow? There it is. I, I, I want to tell you that I learned how to do uh, uh, PowerPoint, but probably not very well. All right, there it is. Uh, so there's the beauty of math. Uh, <coughs> these are the triangular numbers. So the question, okay, am I, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's all right, I know it by heart. <laughs> I don't have to look at it. Uh, these are the triangular numbers, or at least the first, what, six of them? Uh, what's the 500th one? So how are we going to do for the 500th one? Huh? 500 plus 49. Well, you can, there are a lot of ways of doing it, but here's the beautiful way of doing it. That's a 10 by, that's, 10, that's the 10th one. It's easy if you do the 10th. Uh, what do you see? You see a, replica, a replication of the black and the red, right? And now when there are 10 of them, now what happens? Now you still have 10 across, but 11 on top, right? 110. But the original one, therefore, is only 55. Because it's only half of the, of half of the rectangle. Triangles are half of a rectangle, right? They're pretty much. <coughs> so uh, <clears throat> now, now we know what the 500th one is, right? By the way, this is what, 50, 55, right? Which is 10 times 11 time divided by 2. 
<coughs> so the 500th one is 500 times 501 divided by 2. We've solved the problem forever. Uh, so a beautiful idea. Math is full of beautiful ideas uh, that like that. Um, Oh, here's another beautiful idea. Uh, if, if you're, of course, if you're an engineer, you know this, and, or if you have scientific training. But uh, mathematics works with infinite series. You add up numbers forever. Of course, that's only a potential infinity. You can't add numbers forever. Uh, it would take too long. Uh, but uh, so there's a potential infinity. So does this, the numbers are getting smaller, is the sum finite. Well, I've shown you the trick on the bottom. Um, you group the next, uh, you leave the first two alone, you group the next two, there are two of them, right? Now, one third is bigger than a fourth. So that part is bigger than a half. Because one third is bigger than a fourth. If you put a fourth there, you would get two fourths as a half. So that's bigger than a half. Now you group four of them, and each one of those is bigger than an eighth. So now you've got four eighths, one half. What would you do next time? What's the next step? Eight of them. Eight of them. <laughs> Absolutely. Each one of those, the first one would be one ninth and the last one would be one fifteenth. Uh, one sixteenth? One sixteenth. Huh? And uh, nine to sixteen is seven plus one is eight. Yeah. One sixteenth. Each one of those is bigger than one sixteenth. There are eight of them, bigger than a half. What would you do on the next one? Thirty-two. Are you, are you ever going to run out of numbers? No, you never run out of numbers. They go on forever. So this sum is what? Infinitely large, right? Now, my question is, if you're a layman, can you add up infinitely many numbers and have a finite sum? They never, they never disappear, these numbers. If I added, say, 1 plus a fourth, right? Plus a ninth, plus a sixteenth plus the 25th, and so on. I always square the bottom now, right? Instead of having the number on the, bo on the bottom, I square it. Does that number add up to something finite? Can you add up infinitely numbers, infinitely many numbers, and get a finite sum? And the answer is, of course. Otherwise, you wouldn't have a calculator in your hand because calculators compute everything by infinite series more or less. And uh, so, by the way, if you add 1 plus a 4th plus a ninth plus a 16th, you get a wonderful, wonderful answer, pi squared over 6. Pi squared. How the heck does that show up? Uh, I have another beautiful thing somewhere. Oh, well, here's, the, here's my, my uh, I used to, here's the futility. You see, mathematicians are always accused of wasting their time. Uh, there's that misconception. Uh, this was done in, oh, 300 B.C. Uh, they would section a cone. God, what a waste of time, isn't it? So why would you want to section a cone? Who, 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 who'd ever? But, of course, if we hadn't sectioned cone, we would never have an ellipse, which is somewhere there, right? And, of course, we would never know which way the, sun, or the earth moves around the sun, and we would never send anything to the moon. Uh, nothing would happen, and we wouldn't have a parabola where a parabola is used. Every antenna is a parabola, or actually a paraboloid. It's revolve. Uh, um, the other beautiful thing, I think this is the beautiful thing. The other beautiful thing about math is that you get surprising answers, you know? But I wanted the surprising answers all to con contain pi. This, this simple number, pi, where did it come from? Somebody measured the circle and its diameter and the ratio. We don't know what the ratio is, so we call it pi. Right? We have no idea how big it is. But we now know pi, I think, to six trillion places. Is that a waste of time? Let's ask. Six trillion places for pi a waste of time? No. But I won't tell you why. <laughs> uh, and, uh, oopa. Uh, now that I've got another one, don't worry about it. I'm always prepared. Uh, the first one is Einstein's equation for general gravity. It's got pi in it. Uh, the second one is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. It's got pi in it. 
What did X pi got to do with being uncertain about the position and momentum of a particle? Uh, the next one is, I forget what that is. Uh, what? Euler. 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 Euler, the buckling of a column? Yeah, 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 that's what it is. The buckling of a column. See, it's good to have Pardian's <laughs> participation. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the th that next one is the, uh, the period of a pendulum, if it swings. It's got pi in it. Well, that might be, you know, it swings circularly, so that's not so surprising. Now, the one on the bottom, that's phenomenal. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. Uh, you take this weird number E, which is 2.718284858, whatever it is, and then you integrate it from, you find the area underneath it. By the way, if I draw it for you, I guess I could draw it. Uh, it looks like this. You might have a name for it. What, it, what is this called? Sine. The bell curve, right? The bell curve. So this is the bell curve. The area under the bell curve is what? Square root of pi. That integral is the foundation of all of statistics. Well, most of it, not all of it, but most of it. That's the Gaussian distribution. Uh, and it's got this ding-dang number pi in it. And here is the uh, force uh, exerted by what? Two charges, right? And what's it got? Pi. Uh, remarkable stuff. So there ain't no such thing as I'm wasting my time in mathematics. It all comes up, even primes. You know, we talked about primes. Are primes useful? Is it really useful to know primes? Well, if you don't think so, you're wrong because every time you send a money to somebody on your computer, it uses prime numbers to send it. That is the way that uh, security is done. So computer security uses prime numbers. And uh, if you want, uh, I can hold at least 50 lectures a year on all of the places where mathematics is useful. Uh, <clears throat> so that's the beauty of mathematics. All right, that's enough of that stuff, right? You guys aren't convinced. Uh, I'll just go to slideshow. I don't know. I'll just poke on it. I know, I know, I know where it is. I'll just do it myself. That's, that's Adedush. I think he was probably in his 70s there. Uh, this is Adedush with his, that's uh, Graham. Uh, uh, he was in charge of Bell Labs. Bell Labs was probably the, premier think tank next to the Institute of Advanced Study in America. They did incredible stuff uh, in, in, um, in math, science, all kinds of engineering. Uh, the, the transistor was discovered at Bell Labs. Uh, so, uh, and, and that's Graham, and that's his wife, Fan Chung. Uh, she is a Taiwanese, I believe. All, she teaches math at Princeton. And uh, he, he became the surrogate, I told you, he became the surrogate mother. He did everything for Erdős. Erdős would get uh, <laughs> Erdős would get checks from all over the world for his uh, for his talks, and they would come in in I don't know dinars and uh, you know whatever blots or whatever the heck they are, and uh, uh, this guy would deposit them because Erdős was never there, and so he signed Paul Erdős's name to it. And one time, Edgar signed his own name, and they refused the check. <laughs> so, uh, they, you know, but uh, he is a, he's also a great mathematician. I think he's got 25 joint papers with Erdős, and uh, Fan Chung has about 15 of them. So they all, um, they all are there. Now here is, uh, what's next? Ah, there's Erdős's gravesite in uh, uh, the Judo Temetu in Budapest. And... Um, Here's Johnny von Neumann. Uh, he is, uh, I visited his grave in Princeton, and uh, there are two other, the one you, uh, you, you didn't mention, you mentioned Turing, but uh, Kurt Gödel was another great mathematician from the last century. And Gödel is there, and so is Vignet, Vignet Yenu. Uh, and uh, now here's an interesting thing. This is why I told you that, uh, um, uh, von Neumann did not have a difficult time, but, but von Neumann, I, I'll read, uh, maybe at the end I'll just read a couple of things about von Neumann. Um, <clears throat> he was, this was in 1927, I believe, where he, uh, he was already a professor at, at, at the University of Berlin. And you can see the, 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 the topics that he taught 
So he never, he never uh, lacked for money. As, besides that, his father was fairly rich and hadn't lost his wealth by this time yet. But the other guy that's there, you see, is uh, uh, Szilard, right? Yeah. Somewhere there, Szilard is there. Uh, so uh, those guys all went to Germany. And, uh, but uh, those are, he was already teaching at the level, uh, at the farthest extent of mathematical knowledge at this time, which is 1927 or 1928. And uh, uh, <coughs> so, but you see, he's, he's von Margita. He, he liked that nobility. <laughs> and this is a picture of uh, Boyoy. No known picture of Boyoy exists, strangely enough. There was one portrait of him, but he got so mad that he tore it up. Uh, he got so, I think he got mad at his father for something, and he tore up the picture. So we have no known picture. We did not know where he was buried. And then I think 30 years after he died, uh, the Hungarian uh, Tudományos Akademia uh, went and visited the, the woman who had taken care of him, or was his servant, and she showed him where the grave was. So he, he passed in total obscurity. Uh, he, he had only one, pardon me? He's got beautiful statues. Oh, yes, of course, now they're all over. The, you know, there was a big, the reason, I knew a lot about Boyoy because I got a book once about Hungarian mathematicians 50 years ago, and I read it. Uh, but it's very interesting that, you know, this world-famous man, no known picture of him exists. This is, they say that he looked like uh, General Bem mm -hmm. in the, uh, in the uh, Magyar, in the Hungarian, uh, and, and uh, that's, that's what, this is modeled after General Bem. I think this might have been the picture used in a postage stamp, but I'm not sure. And I don't even know what the last one is. Oh, never mind. Uh, we'll go back to that. Uh, uh, and, uh, oh, here, let me tell you, let me read to you something about uh, Teller and Neumann. Teller tells an interesting story about Neumann. It just to prove what a man, I mean, what a brain, brain this guy was, and then I'll tell you. Uh, Teller said that he caught Neumann uh, conversing with his three-year-old son on, as equals. And Teller said that this is the way he talks to us also. <laughs> Uh, let me, here is, here is, uh, here is the, uh, a summation of Neumann. <coughs> now, so it seems fair to say that the influence of a science is interpreted broadly enough to include impact on fields beyond science proper, then John von Neumann was probably the most influential mathematician who ever lived. Uh, he is regarded as one of the giants of modern mathematics. Uh, the mathematician Jean Dieudonné said that von Neumann may have been the last representative of a once flourishing and numerous group, the great mathematicians who were equally at home in pure and applied mathematics and who throughout their careers maintained a steady production in both directions. Um, Peter Lax wrote, Peter Lax was also a, a great uh, Hungarian-born mathematician. He also, uh, well, th there are a lot of things you could say about math, but I guess we're running out of time. It says, to gain a measure of von Neumann's achievements, consider that had he lived a normal span of years, he died when he was only 53 or 54, mm -hmm. he would certainly have been a recipient of a Nobel Prize in economics. And if there were Nobel Prizes in computer science and mathematics, he would have been honored by those too. So the writer of these letters should be thought of as a triple Nobel laureate or possibly a three and a half fold winner for his work in physics, in particular quantum mechanics. Uh, Neumann wrote the first textbook in quantum mechanics, uh, which, you know, and that, that stuff is unintelligible. The one time they, uh, they asked uh, a very famous uh, physicist, I can't remember who it was, but, you know, one of the really top physicists, he says, uh, Mr. or Dr. So and so, is it true that only three people understand Einstein's theories? And he started thinking, and he says, it might be true, but I'm trying to think of the third one. Uh, so so that, you know, th these things are, are, and that's why mathematics is un unexplainable anymore. 
because it's reached such a level, even physics is, is completely unexplainable. I mean, you've got string theory with 11 dimensions, and you've got uh, the collapse of the, uh, of the uh, Schrodinger function doesn't collapse anymore. It now gives you two alternative realities so that we're living in a multiverse with billions and billions of cloned universes. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal what's going on. And there's less and less certainty about what we know. And uh, the more we know, the less certain we are <laughs> about what it is. And the same thing is true, and to some extent, in math also. So I don't I guess I'll stop right here. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry I detained you for so long. <laughs>